Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And my guest today is a good friend, a uh, friend for what, seven, eight years now, something like that. Um, since back in 2013, when I think I met him online, uh, Giacomo Mark. Casey, and he is the co-founder of Vegan Proteins, as well as PlantBuilt.com, which is a nonprofit organization um, of strength-based and competitive athletes, vegan athletes, natural vegan athletes, who compete together to raise awareness for veganism and also raise money for animal sanctuaries. Giacomo has been vegan for over 10 years, is both a natural vegan bodybuilder and a natural vegan powerlifter or weightlifter. Uh, he does fitness and nutrition coaching. He is a judge for the World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship. And hopefully the next one coming up uh, next year, if we can ever get past this COVID thing. And is a member of the Vegan Strong team, uh, who does a lot of uh, education and awareness uh, all over the country for events uh, whenever they come back around to as well. Giacomo also holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. I, when I got the invite, I said, how could I say no? I mean, first of all, I, I haven't seen your face in quite some time. And a while. from a selfish standpoint, I kind of miss you. So it's nice to connect <laughs> personally. <laughs> Likewise. And how's Danny doing? Um, she's doing well. Yeah, Danny's doing all right. We've been mostly at home, right? We had the privilege of already having equipment here. So the isolation has been working. <laughs> and outside of that, we're just looking forward to closing out the year and restructuring the way we do things to make sure that we're supporting the community. I guess uh, for 2020, for business owners like yourself and myself, the word pivot <laughs> it's used a lot. So what kind of things did you have to do um, being a, another vegan business owner, dual vegan business owner? Um, how have you had to pivot, make some changes in, in your structure, both in business and in personal life to adapt to the, the world that we live in today? Hmm. That's a loaded question. Where do I begin? How do I simplify this process? Well, the very first thing that we realized quickly is that there would be panic because we rely on our creature comforts, our ability to go to the gym and our ability to get to the grocery store and our work-life balance is predicated on us getting from point A to point B, however that works. So there was a lot of moving parts and I find that those who are into self-improvement are focused on their scheduling and their discipline. And so when that was thrown out of whack, a lot of people, I felt like there was just a lot of anxiety. Instead of letting the plan come to them, they were like, what's the plan, what's the plan? And that can throw somebody off. So from a coach's standpoint, the goal was to work with our one-on-one -on -one clients and make sure to let them know like, hey, let's, let's give it a week or two to process is, as opposed to throwing our hands up in the air and we'll be able to find out what kind of decisions we need to make. So that was step one, was damage control for the people we work with one-on-one. -on -one. Step two was learning how we could train at home efficiently. We, before the country shut down, we wound up sending out an email. Danny actually, she was like, things are going to shut down. Gyms are going to shut down. And I was busy tending to family matters. And I was like, I don't understand, but I believe you. So let's go ahead and send that email out. So before gyms officially shut down, we sent out an email letting everyone know, like, look, it's about to get real out there. Pick up some bands and here's a bands workout. So that's what we did. We just sent that out to everybody. We knew that we felt that it would be helpful. And that's where it started for us this year. And the journey continued by us continuing to create content for our, for, for our audience or whoever was there that we could support basically to make sure that we were letting them know like, hey, you can train from home, you can, things, can, things can unravel, but you still have yourself, you have your health, you can go on a walk, you can eat a piece of fruit, you can eat a vegetable, 
and you can train at home too and, and get results. So that's kind of the long and short of it as far as the start of the year goes. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how many of these changes that people put in place, like creating home gyms in their garage and things like that, whether they're going to stick or not. I mean, you know, even after people, uh, we open this up, if the vaccines come out and, and the pandemic does finally clear up to a point where most of the businesses are open and back to normal or as normal as possible, you know, are a lot of people still going to be working from home because they've kind of liked it. They've set up a new gym, they have bought equipment, they've done things to, to get themselves going. And how does that change the dynamic? You know, for me, I think a lot of people miss the social element too, um, from the far end, which is competing and that there's nothing like the camaraderie you experience with teammates competing together, um, you know, with plant built, for example, or the World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship, or or even just competing with other friends, and um, and not having that experience is readily available anymore, um, or or the gyms are for for that reason. So there's a social element too that I think is going to be sorely missed. So I'd be curious. Um, I know a lot of trainers like yourself, many of our uh, athletes, the Team Clean Machine athletes have uh, moved to an online um, type structure of business. And, uh, and, and, you know, fortunately for us, we had already pre-positioned ourselves as clean machine to selling most of our products through Amazon and, and online anyway, because just my preference, I wanted to speak directly to people. And how has that been a different experience for you, um, working with people directly and then working maybe with a broader group um, through online coaching and, and both nutrition and training coaching? Working with people one-on-one -on -one when the, with coaching is, it's an emotional job. It's mentally demanding more so than anything. And you give it your all because you want to make sure you're in that person's life and you are that you're, you're their person essentially. So you get involved in everyone's story that you work with throughout the year. And as you would imagine, there were a lot of different scenarios happening. For example, from the competition standpoint, I had eight clients who were already prepping for shows and four out of eight clients took it all the way and became stage lean. One out of eight clients competed on stage and one client is scheduled to compete on stage. And as you would imagine, the moving parts were, <sighs> there's no there's no right way to put it. They, they were um, dramatic and scary because the shows were being moved and being canceled and there was a lot of unknown and there was a lot of a lot of decision making that needed to be made. So at some point I felt personally responsible because in one sense I'm there to support, but in another sense, I'm there making decisions, even though it's not my decision, I'm still part of the equation. So there were, it was a very complicated year for competitors. And from the coach's standpoint, I did my best to, to take it on the chin because it's, it's a two way street. And when someone is that dieted down, they're vulnerable. And it was uncharted territory essentially. So that has been very, we'll say emotionally draining, but it's also part of the, it's, it's something that I'm, it's what I love to do. It's my job essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, there were a lot of individuals who are, were, are, are still on the roster and were on the roster that had family losses, job changes, lifestyle changes, uh, everything you could imagine essentially. Uh, without getting you know personal, right? So there was there was a lot of going through that while still making sure like, hey, you know, we still let's still work on our goals for this year and for next year, and let's still make let's still take care of ourselves, as opposed to making sure that our life is put together. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and and I know uh, for me, especially. You know, I'm uh, 57 years of age, so I'm in that age bracket uh, for COVID where extra caution is 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 necessary. Um, 
uh, you know, fortunately, there is uh, some health attributes to being vegan um, that uh, are some advantages and in, in, in not getting uh, sick uh, in general. Um, but as you get into competitive shape, you uh, definitely can be lowering your immune system. And it's strategically um, an, uh, important, even more important to take care of whatever nutritional um, adjustments that you can make to make sure that your immune system is still healthy and strong and vital during during time where you're actually in a, um, a place of dieting and, and training with intensity that can lower the immune system. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Later on in the year, and, and as of recent, we've been working behind the scenes to think about what we can do to make sure that, hey, that's pretty neat. I didn't realize that we'd have big comments pop it up on the video. Lindsay, <laughs> how are you, my friend? Yeah, Lindsay's scheduled to compete in a couple of weeks, actually, and it's been a roller coaster ride. It really has been. It's been an honor to be in her corner, right? Um, I, the last thing I wanted to do was push anyone to compete. So you have all these conversations where you play out different scenarios. And speaking from my earlier years of coaching was like, well, let's just complete the task. We signed up to do this thing and we're going to do that thing. And as I've realized over the years, that's not responsible coaching because all kinds of things can happen and you need to be ready for anything. Right. So I've, you know, I've tried to focus on having conversations like, well, what if you can't compete? Let's set up a photo shoot. What if we have, what if your show gets moved out? What's going to happen after your show when, when, well, that's the usual conversation where we make sure we take care of someone's mental health after show because someone that is that depleted is, is vulnerable, very vulnerable. And you want to make sure to support them. But even leading up to the show, is it going to be the experience you were looking for? And then when it wasn't, what do we do about that? When it's not fun anymore, but you did it anyway. Mm. How do we get out of that headspace? It's not easy, right? So you, these are the kinds of things that I don't want to say I lose sleep over at night. However, my brain is working. It's not working overtime. It's just working through it one-on-one, -on -one, even when we're not having those conversations every week during the check-in. So, yeah. But getting off the one-on-one -on -one coaching subject, as a whole with, with the community, especially with how divisive things have been. And I mean, that's kind of the nature of the United States, but it seems like it's been extreme this year and people have been pressured, right? With whatever the reasons are, pandemic is not helping, that we felt that everyone needed a win, no matter what. And Danny came up to me and she was like, this thing I've been working on, right? Get Everyone can get results in 28 days, no matter where they're at. And it's okay to start over, no matter where you are and be in it for the long haul. At least that's my wording. She set up this project, this program called the 28 day overhaul. You, we get in just it's, and, and you can literally, no matter what, where you're at, you can get, get your act together, so to speak, and you can get results. And by the end of the 28 days, you'll have some sort of routine and you'll be able to keep working towards your goals. And she was like, I want to release this thing on election day. And I looked at her like, Are you crazy? That doesn't sound like you. But rather than challenging or judging it, I was like, you know what? That's really brave. And I don't understand it, but I trust you. So we launched a thing on election day in the morning. And lo and behold, it was a success. It actually worked out. And now we have a, a couple hundred people that we're, we're working with together to see what we can do. I mean, I really don't know what's going to happen from here, but there's that community out there where we're all on the same page, having a plan for the week, having workouts for the week, having a meal plan for the week. And it's not something that's just laid out. The person who signs up for the overhaul has to do the work. So you're learning as you go. And those are the kinds of tools that we've tried to put out there as opposed to just saying, here's a program, follow it. We try to throw an element of education into what we create because it gets the it gets the client, it gets the the athlete, it gets the person who's starting out for the first time, it gets them engaged and involved. And then of course, hope we hope to bring them into the community and, and support them. 
Oh, this is a nice comment from Nadege from Canada, Miss Miss Wonder Woman herself. Uh, she's awesome. Uh, she's uh, another natural vegan um, uh, competitor. And um, she's saying uh, how much support from, from trainers can really make a difference. Yeah, staying on point when, you know, look, just before COVID happened, before the pandemic, it was hard enough with our busy work lives, with our stressful jobs, with relationships, with home ownership, business ownership, what all these different things that the world throws at us just to stay focused on getting a workout in, you know, that was hard enough as it is just trying to stay focused. And then you got blitzed with advertisements on television and, and, and internet and social media about all this food, food porn, just taking over the, you know, the, the social media sites. And it's like, oh my God, how does anybody maintain a fitness level or commitment to fitness? <laughs> They're just surrounded and adults by it. And then you add COVID on top of that. You add a pandemic on top of that. And, and for some of us, it's like, okay, this is what I do. This is who I am. I am doing this no matter what. But for other people, that's not the reality. And and um, how have you been able to engage people? I, I realize it comes down really being committed to staying healthy comes down to a psychology, comes down to buying in to a way of life. How do you get people to shift from, I think that's the right thing to do. I know that's the right thing to do. I know I should be eating better. I know I should be training today to actually say, I'm going to do it no matter what, you know? Yes, there are times when we get sick or there's emergencies in the family where we have to take care of those and put priorities first. But I'm talking about the regular things to just pull us away and distract us. How have you found working, both you and Danny found working with people on a psychological level to get that mindset and keep them on track. Hmm. <laughs> well, I know there's no one right answer, but you know, there's there's every individual is, is has got their own set of circumstances. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, to keep people on track. I think the first thing to realize is that life is going to change, right? And we need to account for that. And so at any given point in time, if we're too beholden to what's written down on a schedule, well, then we're going to be inflexible to change. So it's a matter of staying ahead of it without overthinking. At least that's my personal approach. So I kind of try to find out where someone's at on a week to week basis and check in with them without pressuring them to, to make sure that they've crossed all their T's and dotted their I's. Like you don't have to do everything perfect. We do, we do need to check in with each other. So I will nudge clients and be like, Hey, let's make sure we communicate. Right. And, and I'll, yeah. So, and a lot of it is listening. Mm. There's a lot of listening that's involved in coaching. And sometimes you get caught up in listening, but you still need to, you still need to say the thing. You still need to make sure that we're sticking to a plan, that we have a plan, right? Uh, so it is a delicate balance in that regard. But <laughs> um, so kind of like throwing things out there, like there's a goal, let's think on it. And then, the, and then the client eventually comes to you and expresses their goal. And if they don't, you kind of remind them like, hey, there's a goal, what's it gonna be? What are, what are we going after essentially? But being willing to pivot. So there's, there is a lot of psychology that's involved in coaching, but yeah, at the end of the day, we, we look at things, I guess we, I guess I look at things on a, uh, from a broader scale, as opposed to what's going to happen over the next eight weeks. What do you want the year to look like? And we sort of circle back to that throughout the year, whether it's uh, mid year or a couple times, whenever it makes sense, we make sure to keep flexible for, life's occasions whether they're planned or unplanned so if there's a vacation coming up what have you i find that i find that athletes want to just keep going they want to just keep pushing and, and when you you can get into a place where you can't stop so we encourage diet breaks and sometimes they feel uncomfortable we're like listen we explain the science behind it 
whether whether you want to whether even though you want to will yourself to keep going, your body's stress doesn't know the difference. So giving yourself a little more food and giving yourself a chance to lower the intensity while you train, well, you're allowing yourself to recover. And now we can adapt to doing even more as opposed to just continuing to go. <laughs> it seems pretty logical, but it's a lot harder to do in practice. <laughs> Well, when you've got emotions and and deep psychology involved in that, where people are habitual in their practices, I mean, there are good habits, and then there are habits that are almost obsessive. And we've got to be honest with ourselves, especially competitive athletes. There can be a tendency to obsess over diet, over perfection, over you know, pushing further and pushing harder all the time and, and not listening to the body, not, not being in touch with the biofeedback mechanisms that keep us on, on track for a, a healthy approach to doing this. I know I've pushed myself to the point where, you know, just going up and weights, up and weights, up and weights, and not recognizing, you know, my age, not recognizing overtraining and, and caused injuries and has taken me out of the game for sometimes months. And that's over the years, fortunately, I've learned from that and grown from that experience and, and learned, hey, don't do that. <laughs> when you feel yourself getting stressed to the max, take a break. You know, this is the right thing for the overall best results anyway, but it's also the right thing for your health. And, and finding that balance for me has been been a really great experience because now my body, when recovers better, I can work out with intensity, but in different ways. I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about than that. There are ways like I can do lighter weights, about 50% of my max weight. And I can use that weight with such intensity, I am white by the end of my workout. <laughs> you know, by using holds, three seconds holds, by using partials, by using all these different training techniques that I've learned over time, um, using uh, negatives, using, you know, forced contractions, um, all these types of things, you can use a lot less weight and still really stimulate the muscle to grow. So there, we need to get out of our comfort box sometimes of, I, I go in there, I do my heaviest weights all the time, every time, you know, and, and get into that mode and, and look at what else is possible in our repertoire. And that's why I think where you come in, where you, Danny, many of the other trainers out there who are really just as concerned with overall health as getting results, where you can actually put in, broaden your palette of different tools in your chest that you can use to balance it in a way so that you can continue to stay in great shape, but do it in a way that also helps you maintain so that you're not busting up tendons, you're not you know, tearing down muscle, you're not putting yourself in immune health stress and things like this that could actually be detrimental to your overall health, especially in the long term. Yeah, for sure. The body is ever changing and I feel like it, becomes that much more important to take care of it the more you beat it up, which is an argument that Danny and I have debated over for years. And I guess we've given more merit to the side of like, you do what you want with your body. And uh, as an athlete, you can have longevity. However, there are things you need to do to make sure to take care of yourself while you're beating yourself up to make sure you have healthy bones and, and you're increasing muscle, right? So that's kind of been our, that's been one of our points and positions for a while now. And we still, I mean, I, I feel kind of strongly about that, <laughs> but I respect the fact that that is not everyone and that there is a balance and you can take that to the extreme and you can do that recreationally and you can also do that. Uh, and, and it's going to change. It's going to change and you have to accept your environment wherever you're at, right? Because if you strive for, if you strive for that, if you keep trying to push harder than you should, when you have something else being thrown at you in life, like whatever it is, then you're going to throw yourself off course, right? So it's it's the long haul, essentially. And as long as you're continuing to move in that direction, you're going to improve over time. 
you don't have to improve in a linear fashion year after year, put it that way. Right. Right. So vegan, uh, 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 vegan strong. So I know you've been working with uh, Robert Cheek and uh, a whole bunch of great uh, vegan athletes. Uh, Corinne Sutton, Team Clean Machine Athlete, uh, also on the Vegan Strong team as well. Um, you were doing amazing work out there, giving out samples, educating the public, reaching the mainstream audience, which I think was so important. Um, Non-vegan athletes, really, and uh, helping to educate them, helping to expose them to ideas, to products, to, to different ways of thinking. That's changed a lot, obviously, since since uh, the pandemic has come around. How, how has your experience with uh, Vegan Strong changed and, and what's going on with Vegan Strong now? You want to talk a little bit about that, some of the adaptations and pivots that you've done through them. We had a business model. We had a, an objective as Vegan Strong, right? And the goal was to reach people in the fitness mainstream. And we were full force with, we're doing this in the public eye in person, similar to plant built, but more uh, activism as far as how many people can we talk to as opposed to the performance activism where we're going on stage and performing essentially. So that's what we did. We went, we went there full circle and we were out there at booths at different various fit expos across the country touring for several years and it worked, it worked. Right. And we worked with different brands and we said, hey, align yourself with the, the vegan philosophy and we'll go ahead and lead with the standpoint that the, you know, plant based diet is where it's at. That's that's the healthiest way to live. That's how we're going to reach people. And whatever that means to each individual is whatever it means. And that's the message that we're going to put out there. Simple as that. And we went out there as, as a, a a, uh, <laughs> a vegan superhero army, right? And and we and we encourage others. Say, hey, come come to these expos. We're going to be doing talks, and we if we're circling around with the attendees, it's not just us; it's everybody. We can basically we we hope to we hoped to affect the fitness mainstream. That's what we did with Vegan Strong. And then March hit, and it was March first, and it was like we're not we're not touring anymore. And so we were left we were left with questions that didn't have answers. What are, what were we going to do with this thing that we've put a couple of years of work worth into? Yeah. Cause when, when Robert approached us with vegan strong and, and a couple of years in, I, I looked and I was like, I'm doing this cause you're my friend and I love you. I don't, I don't need to know the viability of this thing. I don't, I don't care how much time I'm doing this. You're my friend. I love you. And I'm sticking behind this and I trust you blindly. And that's, and that's why I wanted to be involved in vegan strong. It was, that was the only reason really. So fast forward to this year where there was nothing left to do as far as the work we were doing. And we started doing virtual events and, and, and it, and it was working, right? We started growing our online audience, but obviously we were like scrambling because we, we weren't well established. We were only doing it for a couple of years. Long story short, we decided to start up a subscription box service or just like a, a uh, what we're thinking of doing a subscription. But for now it's, we have a monthly box where we have, we contacted all the vegan brands that were giving us samples to hand out and say, Hey, try this sample, join, join the vegan strong, um, so, you know, support the vegan strong um, community. And we, we contacted all of those, companies and more. And we said, Hey, we're going to go ahead and get into people's homes. Everyone's socially isolating. And what can we do to support people? And how can we, I mean, all, all the expos were canceled where, where all these companies meet expo East or West major. How, how are we supposed to continue to get products out there? And that was kind of the concept that we led with. Well, why don't we support these brands that have supported us and let's support the community and let's create this box. <laughs> where there's a whole bunch of products that are, you know, valued at way more than the cost of the box. And hopefully if it worked, we could find a way to have this project still have a chance of being sustainable, vegan strong. And we've been at it for two months now, but it was like a six month, pro six month project in the works. Lots of conference calls in the, you know, behind the scenes, 
lots of heavy lifting, literally boxes upon boxes coming in, storing it in the in the warehouse over here, our home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we just started piecing it together. And I think we're go. I think we are on a second box now. It's pretty exciting. It's it's worked out so far. That's great. And uh, Clean Machine's honored to be a little bit a part of that. We don't actually make sample sizes, but we are including some uh, um, discount codes for uh, the boxes too as well. So look out for those uh, Clean Machine discounts too in the box. So glad to be supporting you guys. You're doing an incredible job of getting information and product samples out there, especially for those in the mainstream who don't have uh, experience or don't know what where to start, you know? Look, when I was turned vegan 35 years ago, I was like, okay, now how do I do this? <laughs> you know, there weren't guides. Fortunately, now there's a lot more tools, a lot more guides. We've got online, we've got social media, we've got things like Happy Cow to get us to restaurants and stores where we can find um, plant-based products. Um, but it's still a challenge for some people, especially when you get down to the specifics, like, you know, where do I get vegan workout gloves or where do I get, you know, what's the best vegan protein powder out there or what should I be taking or what do I really need? Because there's a lot of, you know, obviously there's a lot of people out there saying a lot of different things on social media and in the press, some of which aren't totally accurate. Um, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and um, so there's there's misinformation out there. And, and, you know, a lot of people have come to me and say, how do you sift through the bogus information out there and and the real stuff and i said well i look at the research i look at the science and you know that's a good place to start and yes some of the research has definitely got bias to it too as well so you got to search through that too fortunately that was my field of study in college so i learned to read studies including how to identify who the contributors are and stuff like that and how to identify good studies uh, rcts you know, crossover, double blind, these methods, not observational, not, you know, corollary studies, but looking at more. Still, I love looking at all the research to find some of the incredible information out there and then use that data to try to learn more. In all the changes that you've seen as this explosion of veganism and even vegan fitness come into realm what are you getting the most questions out of from your clients? Not necessarily newbies, but just all the way across the board. What are the big questions that most people are getting? Is it about macros? Is it about, you know, how to get proper nutrients? Which nutrients should we be keying in on and stuff like that? What are you getting from your clientele and from the people that you've come in in contact over the 10 years of being vegan? Well, I find that it's... The conversation is, has evolved over time as veganism has been more readily accessible and more in the mainstream. And there's information at our fingertips now, literally. Back in the day, it was where do you get your protein? So much so that that was literally the, the brand, right? Where do you get your protein? You literally, that's it. That's your, that's your calling card. You named your company after it. Sure. Vegan protein. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that conversation persisted for a while. And then there, and then it changed over to, well, you can get the right amount of macronutrients and the right amount of nutrients. And then we started to talk about, well, can you really get the right kind of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients from plant-based diet? Are we missing things? So we started to get into the this evidence-based world and look at what things like is it is it you know is it the plant-based diet that is affecting things? Is it agriculture in general that's affecting things? But what are we missing out on here nutritionally if we're consuming a plant-based diet? And nowadays, I think it's pretty accepted. Right. Once you're in the know, once you've done enough research, I think the idea out there is not really the myth that the vegan can't build muscle <laughs> and build lots of muscle and perform and recover. Uh, I think it's a level playing field. And if there's enough passion there, you, you know, you can arguably stay healthy, have uh, um, a really nice anti-inflammatory effect from plants. You tend to choose healthier options, feel better, uh, age uh, with um a lower risk of heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So for those who want to be in it for the, for the long term, 
I feel it's a healthier way to be, and you can arguably achieve better results. Um, but the questions, the questions that we tend to get now is like, well, how can I do this in a way that's enjoyable? It's as simple as that, mm -hmm. right? Because there are so many options these days. And I think people are confused. People see things in packages and they're like, well, this is processed. They're like, you start saying, well, you can make this at home. You can, you can use your own process with your own ingredients. Yeah, well, that is or isn't convenient. And it becomes one of those things where it's really just about <laughs> uh, learning how to stock your pantry, how to cook, and how to make it, how to own it, essentially. How to, how to take how you like to eat and veganize it. Uh, as, and there's confusion there. There really is. So it's like relearning how to eat, but I like to simplify it. And I say, Hey, you know, you learn to eat a certain way, the way your family fed you. And then eventually you, you charted your own course. And when you started training, you had to learn how to eat to, to fuel the way you trained. This is no different. Now you're learning how to eat to continue to train for the long term in a way that will allow you to be the healthiest person that you can be. Totally. And, and there are times when I go back and forth for me, it's like, you know, uh, if, if I am waking up feeling great prior to the pandemic, ready and going into the gym all the time, you know, I soak my oats and almonds uh, the night before in a glass of water, pour it into my blender, blend up my own completely organic, raw, sprouted oat nut milk. And that's what I use as my base for my smoothies. And then I'll have a stressed out to the max day where manufacturing and labels are going wrong and things are out of stock. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to Whole Foods and I'm picking up an RTD and slamming it down. I just, there ain't nobody got time for that, you know? So, you know, I balance life. I don't, I, I, I see people struggling so much sometimes when they get into dogmatic approaches. No, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Just don't make it a habit. You know, <laughs> know that there are times in your life where you do need to hit that easy button just to take a little stress out of the life. And, and it's okay. Forgive yourself. Learn to roll with some things sometimes. Look, um, as, as a trained athlete knows, when you're training really hard, your body has a forgiveness level that isn't really there as much if you're a sedentary, not working. So there is some flexibility. Like I can have a donut just for fun on my birthday or something like that, a vegan donut, obviously. And, and my body will recover. Yeah, a little pro-inflammation. I can feel the difference and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm bringing down a, you know, a nice clean green protein shake with lots of phytonutrients and chlorophyll and all that kind of stuff. And it, was a, it was an amazing study that looked at leukocytes, white blood cell count, right? And leukocytes are like a garbage menu. They fill up the bloodstream as an immune response when they're pro-inflammatory substances, toxins, bad food, things like that. Um, and so they looked at the, the white blood cell count and when they ate a standard American diet, their white blood cell count shot through the roof, right? Which is expected. So they said, okay, let's, let's give somebody um, uh, the standard American diet, a standard American diet, but with lots of salad and vegetables and stuff like that in it. And then a completely raw. Well, the completely raw one had practically no leukocytes whatsoever. No response because the body didn't need to. There's no garbage in the bloodstream, right? So what was amazing about the study is they thought, okay, putting a salad together with a standard American diet is going to be somewhere out in the middle. And it wasn't. It was still really low closer to the raw food diet than that. That's how powerful good food is and can hypercompensate for occasional slightly processed stuff. So when I look at research like that and it's showing me what's actually going on in my body, not what I think is going on, not the guilt or shame that, oh, I just ate a bad food. What's really going on in my body? When I see people getting so stressed out about their choices, I know they're putting worse stress damage on their body than if they just ate the damn donut and had a salad with it, you know what I mean? And, and enjoyed life and lived without the guilt, without the shame, without just saying, hey, it's cool, it's good, I'll get in the gym, I'll knock it out tomorrow, you know, I'll, I'll do all raw tomorrow, I'll start my day with raw fruits tomorrow, whatever, you can do that, but be kind with yourself. I, I know you probably had that conversation with people. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, it's really important to be kind to yourself. You can get so caught up and lost in thought. You can get so caught up in your need to achieve something. You can get caught up in your hamster wheel of your responsibilities so that sometimes it helps to just take a step back and breathe and do a little bit of recentering, right? Take a look at how you're eating and be like, hey, what what can what kind of simple changes can I make here without needing to nail all of the details? And you can do it on your own with someone else. You can bounce ideas off of, uh, uh, you know, a friend, a family member, uh, a partner, anyone really. And yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it's super important to take a look at your bias and know that <laughs> you have this higher function, right? But at the end of the day, like everyone else, you have emotions and they're gonna govern you in ways that are nonsensical. So if you if you just take that minute to laugh at yourself and do a little bit of digging without doing heavy soul searching, then you can find some simple answers on the surface. And then the and then the deeper stuff, some some of it sorts itself out organically and some of it comes to the surface and you're like, wow. I didn't realize that all of these things were, you know, were, were at work behind the scenes, like, you know, in my body. But for me, it's as simple as controlling the, the things, you know, what, how you're eating, what's on your plate, right? And balancing that out over time. So if there are foods that you've restricted for whatever reason, then you have a negative connotation, a negative relationship with those foods, then it helps to to start to find ways to work them in as opposed to saying, well, I'm just not going to eat these things because they're calorically dense or they're hyper palatable or they're, you know, or they're bad for me. Well, the truth is like most people, uh, you're probably going to eat cake around once a year, maybe more. Uh, you're probably going to have a bag of potato chips uh, once or twice a year. Uh, you're probably going to have a social gathering where you're, you know, you're going to eat something that's rich and, and you know maybe maybe sweetened in a way that you wouldn't normally sweeten on your own but there's nothing wrong with stuff like that and it's okay i mean it's it's not that there isn't anxiety around those kinds of scenarios but i think having some acceptance having that kind of philosophy when it comes to nutrition i think it i think it helps make it so that you're able to balance yourself out and you're able to take comfort in the way that you eat most of the time. And those times you can enjoy as well. So for me, it's all about finding a way to make it a lifestyle as opposed to this is what I need to do to get from point A to point B. And that's good. Here's a here's an interesting question from Raymond Deckard, uh, 78 years old, losing some strength. Um, sarcopenia, for, for those who are not familiar with the word sarcopenia is, age-related muscle loss, um, so it's described in the medical community. I personally don't believe uh, in uh, age-related muscle loss. There is a little bit, but I think this can be offset by uh, uh, consuming the uh, proper amount of protein. So most of the research that I've read on protein show that um, there is um, what some call protein fatigue or um, uh, protein um, uh, resistance. Um, so people, especially older people now, have eaten probably too much protein over a longer period of time and probably have gotten some receptor resistance. So the cells are actually resistant to taking in protein because so much protein has been around their lives so, so long. So as we age, we're getting a little resistant to it. So interestingly, they found in most of the studies that I've read, that you need uh, older people actually need to eat higher amounts of protein to compensate for this factor, um, or and or uh, consume branched chain amino acids, or specifically, more specifically, leucine. Um, leucine does increase uh, muscle protein synthesis, uh, the uptake of the amino acids into the cells. So that, that's one of the things I do personally as a 57-year-old. You know, I'm up to close to 190 when I'm uh, in my top weight, and and uh, that's carrying more muscle than I was m in my 30s, just because of proper nutrition, proper training techniques. 
What kind of uh, advice do you have somebody who is in their 60s, 70s or older and is really experiencing um, not only just for not bodybuilding purposes, but just for maintaining overall health and strength? Because we know um, through the research that one of the uh, greatest initial causes of death in elderly, especially in nursing homes, is falling. And that's because they're losing strength. And when they fall, they have hip fractures or bone fractures that don't heal, cause infections, and then can lead to death. So it's very important to maintain strength as you age, um, but especially in our, our very senior years for that reason. So what are you, some of the things that you do in coaching people who are in their late 50s, 60s, 70s? Movement. Movement is so important. You can go through a workout and feel accomplished, and that's really good for the spirit. However, if you're not focused on movement, then you can wind up losing the ability to improve your posture. You can wind up not maximizing your potential to train your muscles. So it's really about moving well. Like I'll, I'll find that there are limitations, right? And I think they're perceived because we're used to moving in a certain way. We find a way to continue to walk, to sit down, to stand up, and to do activities in a way that is safe for us, in a way that our body will allow us to do them. And then our emotions tell us that this is what we need to continue to do to be safe. And that's right. However, when we get into moving properly and with good posture, we wind up improving our posture over time. And so you take some basic movements like a squat, for example, and a pressing movement and a row and a pull. And you can do these things at home with bands, for example, and you focus on training with good posture. And what happens is your posture improves and it doesn't matter what age you're at, your posture improves. So that relieves some of the pain that we've been holding on to for years by our muscles tightening up and while also being conditioned and being in ways that they, you know, that they just age over time. Like we just wind up filling out our vessel in a different way over, over the years. But when we start to train with good posture, you know, the kind of posture that we unlearned that we had naturally as a child, we wind up getting that back. And it takes some time, but it is 100% possible. And it feels uncomfortable. However, if we go through it week after week, the body will render in a way that will allow it to improve. You can, you can increase your muscle at any age. You can improve your posture at any age and you can feel better while also listening to your body when it tells you, hey, we've done enough for the day. Let's wrap it up and get to the, the next workout two days later, three times a week, 30 minutes a week, even two times a week, 30 minutes a week can make a world of a difference. And I do feel like mobility work can also help. So maybe something as simple as committing to two 15 to 30 minute resistance training sessions in one 15 minute mobility session, something like that, while also focusing on your nutrition and making sure that you're getting in the right amount of protein to support recovery. Something as simple as that can make a world of a difference for someone's health, the way that they feel and their ability to, to increase their bone density as well as their lean body mass in general. Great stuff. And, and, to uh, Raymond and, and for many of you out there, this is why uh, personal trainers can be so advantageous. It's not just getting on the spot. It's actually doing the minor correctives. Like uh, Corinne focuses on correctives for a lot of people, which is correcting the way you lift, the way you, you're, you're holding your posture, your frame, your bone getting those back into their proper places so that when you do lift, you don't set yourself up for injury. Uh, so much easier to, to become injured once you age because most of us have developed poor posture. So thank you, Giacomo, for bringing that up because that's so important. But it's hard to tell. If you're looking at your body for, for 50 years, 
you don't see the changes, but a coach, a trainer who knows it and seen lots of bodies can see the inconsistencies, the things that need correction that you cannot see and you will not see by doing it on your own. You may think you're doing it right and you may be setting yourself up for further damage and weakening the muscles rather than strengthening them overall. Great advice. And, and that's why it's so important. I think why coaching is so important um, to, to lean on um, is there's so much we can all learn, no matter how far along we think we are. I still love talking to other trainers, um, not a trainer myself, but I mean, other trainers than, than the ones I know personally, because I love every person's individual look at it, depending on their experience, and how much they care about it. Are they in it for a business or are they in it truly to help you? And that's why I love having friends like Giacomo and Danny, who I know from my heart of heart, truly have your best interest at heart, are, are thinking about you, your health, and what you're contributing to and impact, but your long-term goals as well as your short-term goals. Not just, hey, let's gain some muscle, but hey, let's do this right and let's set you up for a lifetime full of, of a lifestyle of doing this correct, including mindset, including posture, including uh, a variety of different techniques to incorporate, to keep it interesting, to keep it fun, to keep the progress going changing perspectives so that you don't see things as ho-hum, as boring, that you see things as new, as fresh, as exciting, and you have that motivation to get in the gym or, or get to your workouts or pick up your bands and do them, that you look forward to them like I do. I love working out. I know, Giacomo, you know, I feel that way too as well. Uh, for me, it's exciting. It's something I truly look forward to, so it's easy for me to do, but getting people to that place, it can make a difference. And just keeping you on point. For so many of us, it's so easy to get distracted. It's just like, oh, well, I've got too much work on my plate today, I'll skip it. And then tomorrow, well, I got a dentist appointment, I'll skip it. Oh my God, I've got to pick up the kids, I forgot to do that. Okay, well, let's just skip it. You get into skip it's so long enough and you're, you're done. <laughs> you know? Yes, there are certain things where you do have to work around, but if you can set up standards to keep you out of that trap, then this is what coaching, good coaching can really help you to do. So speaking of what's coaching, how can people get in touch with you and Danny, uh, both with Vegan Proteins and Plant Built and even Vegan Strong to find out about the, the box? Tell us how they can get connected with all those and get in touch with you in case they're interested in, in your services. If you're interested in a win, we have the 28 day overhaul on vegan proteins. We just launched it last week and it's only $27 and it's worth like way more than that. We actually, we mold over, we molded over for a while because we like pretty much put our best stuff out there and package it up as in a way that is, that you'll be sure to get something out of it. Um, but we felt that it was important to put that out there. So the 20th day overhaul you can find on veganproteins.com and you can find a whole lot of free quality, valuable content on veganproteins.com as well. We run a podcast. We put out episodes out every other week. We also run a, our YouTube channel where we put out new episodes every week or as often as possible. And then we have other places where you can find us like Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. And with vegan strong, you can find, you can go to veganstrong.com and you, I believe the October box is sold out. I'm not sure. However, we do have a November box. It's the perfect gift for somebody, whether for, whether it's for yourself or for someone else, and you'll get exposed to like over $150 worth of vegan goodies from free coupons at stores, to products, to different vegan swag, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a way to support the Vegan Strong movement. And you can also find the team at Vegan Strong Team on Instagram. Awesome. So good to see you, my friend. We, we, we got to not wait so long between talking to each other. <laughs> For sure. 
Good catching up with you. Give my love to Danny and uh, Robert, if you happen to see him again. I don't know uh, if you guys, when was the last time you saw Robert Cheek? Well, we connected during the launch. I gave him a call because there's, you know, we just try to budget our time. I miss the, I miss him so much. And mm-hmm. well, Danny and him talk constantly. So I feel like I'm part of them by an extension and while well, I'm working on other projects, but admittedly, like, yeah, I wish we spent more time together. I wish we chatted more, but we tried our best to to do as many different things as possible that are helpful and efficient. But hopefully, as things clear up and when they clear up, maybe we'll get to hang out and stay in touch in person again at some point. Awesome. <laughs> and I hope that day comes for us too, my friend. I miss uh, the times that we've hung out together, both on the at the Vegan Strong booth and. Uh, uh, different dinners around the, the place, different trade shows and events, uh, even veg fest, and and of course uh, the World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship. We'll hope to get that back up again in uh, 2021, uh, just depending on um, if we get this uh, virus under control. And um, it would be amazing to have at the end of next year have you back, have you and Danny both back as judges for the event, uh, and or even maybe competing. Who knows? Anything possible. <laughs> There's, I don't have a set date because at this point it takes longer to get prepared, but I'm certainly, I have my sights set in a competition for the future. And, and then after I compete, it'll be Danny's turn. So we don't talk about it because our schedules are open-ended right now for competing. Mm-hmm. It's more of a personal thing, but we do train towards the, for, for the next show. So yeah. But uh, I'm I'm really glad you I'm really glad you invited me on and um, yeah it's good to catch up Jeff. Likewise. Well, thank you and stay tuned for next week's Facebook Live where we're going to have Giacomo's significant other, <laughs> Danny Taylor. It will be joining us. She is a figure or physique figure champion pro actually excuse me figure pro right she won a pro card correct. No, champion, champion, took first place. (laughs) She is amazing, but uh, she is a wealth of information. She's a beautiful soul. She's going to have some great advice, especially for women. So I'm sure we'll dive deep into that aspect of it too. Thank you again, Jack Mo, for having me on. Such a good to see you again, my friend. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. So stay tuned and watch for next Thursday. And uh, Danny Taylor will be on. Look forward and thanks for thanks for joining us on this Facebook live. Pleasure to be here.